In this video, we're going to cover an overview of the human cardiovascular system. We're going to break down the functions and overall organization of the cardiovascular system, and we're also going to follow the path of a drop of blood through the heart and circulatory. We're going to break down both of these diagrams here and label everything. So first of all, what is the cardiovascular system? The circulatory system is also called the cardiovascular system, where the word cardi refers to the heart and vascular refers to the blood vessels. It consists of the heart, which is the pump that generates the pressure gradient for blood flow, the blood vessels, which are a series of tubes filled with blood, and the blood itself, which is the transport medium. The blood transports nutrients, oxygen, and waste products to and from cells. So then, what is the main function of the cardiovascular system or the circulatory system? At its simplest, it can be considered a transport mechanism. The primary function of the cardiovascular system is to transport materials to, between, and from various parts of the body as well as the external environment. And the transport of these materials can be divided into three main categories. The transport of materials entering the body, transport of materials between cells or organs of the body, and transport of materials that need to leave the body. So whether we're talking about bacteria or humans, all organisms need to exchange materials with the external environment because the body requires nutrients from the external environment in order to function. And we're also going to be producing waste products that need to be removed from the body. Let's break this down further and go through some examples. Substances that enter the body from the outside environment include nutrients, water, and gases. And what I've put inside these brackets shows the substance being moved from and to. So for oxygen, it's from the lungs and to all cells. Okay, next up, substances that move from cell to cell within the body. So first up, hormones. Hormones are substances that act at a distance and require the circulatory system to transport them from the site of synthesis to the site where they exert their effects. Cell-to-cell -cell communication is a very important function of the cardiovascular system. We also store nutrients in between meals and we need to metabolize those nutrients so that they can reach our metabolizing tissues during those fasting periods between meals. So the blood transfers nutrients to metabolically active cells such as glucose from the liver and fatty acids from adipose tissue. It's also important for the transport of components of the immune system such as white blood cells and antibodies. And we also transport waste products between different areas of the body. And the third category is waste that cells eliminate. Carbon dioxide that's generated through aerobic metabolism, but also metabolic waste products are produced from normal body functions. So here we have metabolic waste. Some products are transported to the liver for processing before they're excreted in the urine or feces. All right. And then there's heat, which is important in thermoregulation. Okay, so that's the function of the cardiovascular system. Let's now subtract complexity and break down the components of the circulatory system. We mentioned earlier that the human circulatory system has three basic components. First is the heart, which is considered the pump. The heart is what generates the energy needed to push the blood through the system. The second component, the blood vessels the tubes through which blood is directed, and the third is the blood. So all of those different materials we talked about, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and waste products are all being transported through the circulatory system in the blood. How beautiful is that? It's like water slides. So think of the blood vessels as slides and the blood as the water transporting all these substances. Now here's the thing. The human circulatory system is a closed loop with only one direction of flow. It's unidirectional, and it consists of two loops. The two loops are known as the pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation. This is quite overwhelming, but it'll make sense. Let's simplify this diagram first to break down the two circuits. Let's go through the pulmonary circulation. This is a small loop. The pulmonary circulation carries blood between the heart and lungs. The blood is being pumped out of the heart via the pulmonary artery, okay? It's going to go through the lungs 
and it's going to get returned to the heart. So that's the pulmonary circulation. That's one loop. The other loop is the systemic circulation, which is much larger, and it carries blood between the heart and all the other organ systems. Okay, so the blood leaves the heart via the aorta, and some blood goes up via the ascending arteries to go to the head, the neck, and upper limbs. And some of the blood goes down via the abdominal aorta, where it goes to the lower limbs. And then the blood returns back to the heart. So those are the two main loops of the circulatory system. We have the pulmonary circulation, which again carries blood between the heart and lungs, and the systemic circulation, which carries blood between the heart and other organ systems of the body. Now blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart are called arteries and blood vessels that return blood to the heart are called veins. As you can see here, for the pulmonary and systemic arteries, they're carrying blood away from the heart and the veins, both pulmonary and systemic, return blood to the heart. The best way to remember which vessel is which, A for artery and away from the heart, okay? And for veins, the letter V looks like a downward arrow, which signifies the blood returning to the heart. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at some of the key structures in the cardiovascular system, beginning with the heart. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the overview picture first, and then we'll look at the order in which the blood is passing through the different structures. Okay, but can we take a moment to just appreciate this masterpiece? <laughs> because it took quite a while to finish. Okay, so the heart is divided into two sides or halves. We have the left side and the right side. And it's divided by this central wall here, known as the septum. As you can see here, and as you'll see in other diagrams of the heart, the right side of the heart is on the left side of the page, which means that the heart is labeled as if you were seeing or viewing the heart of a person facing you, okay? So the two sides of the heart are separated by the septum. So blood doesn't directly cross from the left side into the right or vice versa. Now each side of the heart has two separate chambers, an atrium and a ventricle. So there are four chambers in the heart. The atria are located above the ventricles. So here we have the left atrium that's sitting above the left ventricle. And like I mentioned before, the heart is labeled as if you were viewing the heart of a person facing you. So the left side of the heart is on the right side. And on the other side, we have the right atrium sitting on top of the right ventricle. And these two, the atria and ventricles, have different functions. The main function of the atria is to receive the blood that is returning from the circulation. So the blood that is going into the left atrium is being returned from the lungs. The blood then moves from the atrium into the ventricles. Atrial contraction pushes blood into the ventricles. And it's the ventricles that pump blood back out, back into the circulation, okay? So the atria contract first, followed by the ventricles, A before V. Again, the atria receives blood returning to the heart from the blood vessels, and the ventricles pump blood out into the blood vessels and back out into the circulation. Now we mentioned before that blood flows to the heart in one direction, and this is due to the presence of a series of valves that we're going to go through in the next lecture. For now, just understand that there are valves that ensure that blood flows to the heart in one direction. These valves are located between the atria and ventricles, as well as the ventricles and circulation. And the presence of these valves make sure that we keep the unidirectional flow of blood. Okay, let's look at the order in which the blood is passing through. This is a walk in the park. Let's start at the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary circulation through the pulmonary arteries. We have the left and right pulmonary arteries where it then passes through the lungs. Blood is delivered to the left and right lungs respectively by the left and right pulmonary arteries. Okay, as it passes through the lungs, it's going to pick up oxygen. The newly oxygenated blood then leaves the lungs through the pulmonary veins, which return it to the left side of the heart into the left atrium. Because remember, the atria are the receiving or collecting chambers. And we've also completed the pulmonary circuit. So now, the blood passes through the left atrium into the left ventricle, and it's the left ventricle that pumps the blood out into the systemic circulation via the aorta, 
where it then goes through the remaining parts of the systemic circulation. And then as the blood returns from the systemic circulation, it returns to where? Into the right atrium via the superior and inferior vena cava. From the right atrium, blood moves into the right ventricle. What happens then, okay? So it moves into the right ventricle where it can then get pumped into the pulmonary system and the process begins all over again. Okay, wow, that was a lot, okay? So let's sum up what we've just covered in a few steps. Blood leaves the right ventricle and enters the pulmonary circulation to pass through the lungs. It returns to the heart via the left atrium and then enters the left ventricle. Remember, A before V, the atrium contracts first, followed by the ventricles, and then the blood leaves the left ventricle and enters the systemic circulation. It then returns to the heart, to the right atrium, and then to the right ventricle, and then the process starts all over again. All right? So essentially, the right side of the heart receives blood from the tissues and sends it to the lungs for oxygenation, and then the left side of the heart receives the oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it back into the circulation to tissues throughout the body. All right? Now, an important thing to see here that you may have noticed is that blood is colored differently. Sometimes it's colored blue and sometimes it's colored red. Oxygenated blood or blood that contains lots of oxygen is indicated as red. And blood that doesn't contain much oxygen is indicated as blue. It's often described as deoxygenated, but that just means it has less oxygen than the newly oxygenated blood that's flowing from the lungs to the tissues. But in living people, well oxygenated blood is bright red and low oxygenated blood is a darker red. However, low oxygenated blood can, under certain circumstances, give the skin around the mouth and under the fingernails a bluish tint, which is why we represent it as blue in diagrams. And you can see here as well, there's some sort of color change gradient from red to blue. This just indicates that oxygen has left the blood and diffused into the tissues. It's pretty cool, right? Now, one more thing you need to remember about arteries and veins is in the systemic circulation, the arteries are going to be carrying oxygenated blood. But in the pulmonary circulation, the artery is going to be carrying deoxygenated blood. Again, the arteries carry blood away from the heart and the veins carry blood towards the heart. A for arteries in the way from the heart. All right, so we've covered the two circuits and blood flow through the heart. Let's take all of that and trace the direction of blood with this diagram beginning at the aorta. The systemic circulation is taking that oxygenated blood and transporting it through the different working tissues. And as the blood passes through all these different organ system, systems, the oxygen is going to leave the blood it's going to deliver oxygen and it picks up carbon dioxide. Then the systemic circulation returns to deoxygenated blood. Remember, it's not completely devoid of oxygen, okay? And it goes back to the right atrium. This deoxygenated blood then gets pumped into the pulmonary circulation via the pulmonary artery. Remember, the arteries carry blood away from the heart. So the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood away from the heart and towards the lungs. As that deoxygenated blood passes through the lungs, it picks up oxygen and gives up carbon dioxide. From here, where do we go? Yes, the pulmonary circulation then returns that newly oxygenated blood back to the left atrium where it can be pumped into the systemic circulation again. Wow, absolutely beautiful. That's the order of structures that the blood is passing through. Now, one last thing that we're gonna look at in this overview of the cardiovascular system is briefly talk about the forces that drive blood flow. Because the question is, what actually drives blood flow? <laughs> okay, how do, we, how do we do this? How does this all work? Blood flow is driven by differences in pressure or pressure gradient. So blood will flow from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. If we show this in a graph, beauty, we can see the systemic blood pressure as the blood moves through the different parts of the cardiovascular system. So starting with the aorta here, this is where the pressure is highest. And then as the blood flows through the arteries and into the capillaries and into the venous system, the pressure is dropping. So the pressure in the cardiovascular system drops as blood moves through the system of vessels. Blood flow, again, is being driven by the difference in pressure. So the blood is able to move from the aorta into the arteries because the pressure in the arteries is lower than that in the aorta. So that is what drives the movement of blood. Beautiful.
And this concept of pressure gradients is important in understanding not only the cardiovascular system, but also the respiratory system and other things in the body that rely on the difference between two areas to facilitate movement between those different areas. Okay, so the forces that drive blood flow are the pressure gradients. On the other hand, the main thing that opposes blood flow is resistance. And what influences resistance is the diameter, the vessel diameter. We're going to cover this in the blood vessels lecture, but for now, just understand that the resistance is the force that opposes blood flow. As resistance rises, less blood will flow through that area. And the smaller the vessel diameter, the greater the resistance to blood flow. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!